Mug, June 2014, Shell Programming, Scott Moser. server um, and cloud, uh, those sorts of products. Um, I'm on the Ubuntu server team, and so if you've used Ubuntu, probably you've run through some code that I've contributed or edited or broke. So um, tonight's talk is about shell programming or shell scripting. There. So generally I talk about why, why would you want to do shell programming? How to take it uh, from what is a script to a program and some tips and then take questions. So there's that's uh, a very popular thing I've seen before. Um, go away or I'll replace you with a shell script. I think a lot of us have gotten our first introduction to programming it, or at least shell programming you know, in, in a similar way of you know, had a series of commands that you ran and then just wanted to run those all one after another and so and put some logic in and then it just kind of grows iteratively and then a lot of times you end up with a with a larger script um, so I think that a lot of people now will consider that shell has kind of had its day and we are past that um, you know previously init scripts were written in shell um, you know, System 5 and it was pure bin sh, replaced largely by upstart and then System D and things like that where shell kind of was was being torn at the edges. Um, so a lot of people, you may think that shell is kind of done. I, there is a lot of, there is still a lot of places for shell um, and it, it honestly solves a lot of problems simply. And, you know, probably when you're interacting with your computer, at least on, you know, most, I think probably most of the audience here interacting with computer involves interacting with a shell. So familiarity with that actually didn't just kind of goes into programming of it and kind of makes its way back to your interacting with a shell. As when I sit at a shell, a lot of times I'll actually write, you know, for loops and things, just to type them at the command line. Well, you know, when you say shell, you mean the command line. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. So my my shell. Ah, come on now. Who runs his default is bash. I mean that. Yeah. So that's bash. You know, these are all those are all shell commands um, that are interpreted by your shell, and so you know you can do. Um, that's shell programming in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. I just told it to iterate a loop over each one of those things and that right there is I think the sort of program that, the first, that you write the first time you interact with shell and then you realize that that right there has like six scotches in it. <laughs> <laughs> So why do, I, why do you want, why would you want to use shell versus Python or Perl or Ruby or C or um, Go? You know, um, shell is very fast. Um, you can, you know, a lot of people may, you, you may think that it's not, um, but in a lot of cases it is, it is very fast and the, the benefit, So this is a uh, here. I want to just show kind of startup performance of different programs. Um, if, you, if you're going to write a program in in Perl or Python or Bash or Ruby, you're going to in, incur the, the first thing you do or, or Java. That was a famous one. I should have put that here. It would, it would have been funny. Um, 
but you, you incur the overhead of just of loading the program off disk into memory you know, and going through its initialization routines to get somewhere before you can do anything. So this is just looping through uh, a thousand times invocation of each of these programs from bin true to bin sh to bin bash, Perl, Python 2, 3. Um, actually, then rather than. Um, no. no. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, yeah, so. Well, they might. Well, not by default. Um, yeah. SH is dash. That was actually changed in Ubuntu in 2006, I think, oh, okay. and primarily for the for the reason of boot is slow, um, because bash is significantly heavier than dash um, and other uh, and other POSIX uh, compatible shell. Just because it's got a lot more features, it's it's bigger. Um, so let's see. Here's an example output. I can run this, but once we get down to the bottom there, ah. Uh, oh, well, I must have failed. Ruby, Ruby doesn't really run that fast. I didn't have it when I ran the program. <laughs> um, so you can see, like, so, so the built-in, the built-in to shell colon, which is basically a, you know a shell built-in for true. Essentially, is looped through a thousand, a thousand iterations of that in three thousand of a second. Um, invoking the program slash bin slash true, and going through the the LD, you know, the loader, loading the thing, pulling it off of disk. After you know, the second time it runs, it's in the it's in memory. So this is getting rid of that, but still, just invoke true took a, roughly a thousandth of a second each time, right? Um, and then sh is is very close to true to do sh to do fork to sh that let's see, effective what that is um, so that is um, bin sh so that second one bin sh my c is that differs from the first one because on the first one all we do is we stay in the same shell. And the third one here is actually we, we, we invoked a program and told it to do nothing. Basically, it said no more. And so that's what I did with the other things too. Um, and so you see that you know the overhead of invo invoking even Perl is, is dramatically more than Bash. And then once you go to Python or Python 3, it, it gets laughable. I mean, to, to the overhead of invoking a program. So how does PHP in there? Um, I doubt I have PHP easily installed anywhere that I can tell you. But um, but I mean it's really yeah. If you just invoke, I would I would suspect that PHP exit is somewhere between Perl and Python. That would be my guess. Yeah. Um, so but if I write something in PHP, I'm not going to write it in shell. No, but what I'm saying is, if if you if you invoke the the cost of invoking of a program of invoking PHP code, yeah, it, there's a cost to that, right? And so every time there are ways around getting incurring that cost in a web server, but essentially every time you know a web server hit comes in, PHP goes through its initialization processes and starts reading code, and if the first thing is exit. Already, it has done a hell of a lot of work. The computer has done a hell of a lot of work at that point, and it's done a lot more than like to run slash bin and slash sh. So, yeah, trying to show that the 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 cost incurred in invoking an interpreter, basically, is what I'm trying to show here. Um, basically, I think what you're saying is that if you need to use the interpreter because of what you're doing, the sophistication of it or whatever, uh, go for it. But if you're just trying to do something simple, it's yeah. so fast in shell that by the time right. the whole thing to be done, you need less time than it would take to start the other thing. Yeah, so... Simple friends, jobs don't do in uh, high time. Right. Well, it, it just depends. I mean, I said simple, simple project. Yeah. 
<laughs> so here I've done So this. can I have HTML submit to a, to a shell script then? Well, no, essentially, so every time, every time your, web, your web server takes a hit, it, it invokes fast CGI or other things get around this, but essentially, user bin PHP comes off of disk, gets loaded into memory, a whole bunch of operations happen, and then it starts reading your PHP snippet, right? And until that PHP snippet happens, yeah, shell is not a replacement for PHP, but the interpreter, but let's see, but PHP is an interpreter, and there was a lot of cost to getting to it to interpret code. Right. So if you and, can get... And, and you could write CGI scripts in shell if you want. Yes. Yeah. And then the fork overhead. Um, so I was... So also, one one other point on that last thing I wanted to set the show is that... The, let's see. A lot of this... Yeah, so... Actually... So most of this is just simply the overhead of fork. Because you can imagine bin true is pretty lean on <laughs> code that it's executing, right? But every time you fork a process, you incur an overhead. Because the, the loader comes up, it loads a bunch of shared libraries into place, da 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 da, da all this stuff. And the second, you know, and the, the subsequent 999 times that I ran that true, they didn't actually hit disk. They came out of the Linux file system cache, right? So all that stuff was all cached. If you're going to run a program, the, the, the biggest place that I'm annoyed by bad shell programs or Python in my path is when there's a server, when I, when I have to go to a system and it's performing poorly, meaning it's out of memory or it's disk IO is crashed, right? And, that mean, and when I SSH in, any program that's in my way means it has to get loaded out of swap or something, or bin, you know, bin, bin SH has to get loaded off disk. Most likely, bin, bin SH never leaves memory. But Perl and Python and Ruby, those things, and all the, all those things will then incur file system hits uh, actually off of disk. And so if you're trying to help to fix a dying server, all of those things aren't helping you. <laughs> If they're in, if they're in your um, critical path, it's not helpful. Yes, right. All of that stuff is bad.